Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. I am Carly Riley. On today's show, I have Mac Flavel, who I'm so excited to have brought onto this podcast because Mac is very fun. He actually was the person who came up with the idea for CryptoKitties, which is one of the very first NFT projects and, in fact, was the project that gave way to the ERC-721 standard that all NFTs today, for the most part, conform to. Uh, so we talk a lot about, about the history and what it was like back in the early days, why CryptoKitties was able to be so successful. We also talk about his latest projects. He's now the CEO and founder of Big Head Club, which is the company you might know for having partnered with Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher to release Stoner Cats. But he's done a number of projects since that as well with Big Head Club. Uh, so he also, at the very end of this episode, makes some predictions about the future of the space. So stay tuned for that. A couple warnings before you totally dive in here. Um, one, we curse quite a bit in this episode. Mac is a bit of a cursor. I'm a bit of a cursor. And then when I'm around somebody else who's a cursor, it really gets unlocked. So uh, please just be cognizant of that. If you have kids around or if you feel uncomfortable with swear words, I, for what it's worth, probably worth putting it out there. Uh, and then also we recorded this episode a number of weeks ago, and it was actually before uh, Matt's latest project had dropped, Big Head Club's latest project had dropped. That is their Ghostbusters project. Um, so they launched a collection of NFTs for around Ghostbusters, uh, the animated film that is released, releasing soon. Um, so anyhow, that there's some time timing differences because we talked about it as if it were coming up, but it has already happened now. So you can go check out Ghostbusters, um, The Afterlife on OpenSea. And I think those are all my caveats so please, please enjoy this episode. Uh, we'll hear from our sponsors first, though. Zerion is the perfect place to view the entirety of your crypto portfolio all in one spot. Not only does Zerion aggregate all the tokens across all of your wallets, but it also displays the NFTs that you've been tirelessly collecting. Zerion even reports the value of your NFTs in your overall portfolio, giving you the most comprehensive report on the entirety of your crypto portfolio. Zerion isn't just a place to get an understanding of your portfolio, but it also hooks into DeFi activities like trading, borrowing, and lending, all in one convenient place. So you don't have to memorize all the various DeFi websites to do all of your DeFi activities. To get started, go to zerion.io slash bankless and load up your wallet or wallets into the Zerion interface and supercharge your DeFi experience and enrich your NFT lifestyle. That's Z-E-R-I-O-N slash bankless. I want to give a special thanks to overpriced JPEG partner, Block Block. Not only because they are a sponsor of this show, but also because they are my employer. Block Block is an innovative blockchain lab. We work across NFTs and the metaverse. And our goal is really to push the industry forward with every new project we take on. We founded and currently run the Nibits DAO, which just partnered with Larva Labs to create more metaverse-friendly renderings of Nibits, which is awesome. We are also partnered with a Sundance award-winning filmmaker to build the first DAO that will own a feature-length documentary film. We have a ton of cool projects down the pipeline and are really looking for cool people to partner with on this. So go to blockblock.io to subscribe to our newsletter and be kept up to date about what we have going on and also to check out open roles we have available. Would love to have you apply, come work with me, coming out, blockblock.io. Here we go. I am so excited to have you on the show, Mac. You and I have actually, I've had the pleasure to chat with you a number of times before this, so I'm not meeting you for the first time here. Um, and... I, I want to intro, like introduce you by saying that you have been a part of at least two groundbreaking projects in the NFT space. And I want to name those projects and see if the audience can spot the theme. So the first project <laughs> is CryptoKitties. You may have heard of it. And the second project is Stoner Cats. <laughs> Spot the similarity. <laughs> so Mac, what is your thing for cats? I will. I can legitimately tell you my things for cats right now, and it has to do with Crypto Kitties. So, also, okay, we're gonna tell a story. I'll tell you another story about cats after, because there's a third cat thing you don't know about. Oh. Uh, uh, but here's where the cat thing comes from. So, wow, we're just gonna get right into it. Okay, so. 
I used to work at a company called Axiom Zen, and Axiom Zen was a foundry before that was a thing, or an incubation something, a startup studio. You know, we never quite found the words for these. Betaworks was pioneering this model years ago in New York and that kind of thing. Um, at Axiom Zen, we used to build incredibly high quality software. It was award winning. We won like Apple Design Awards and Webby Awards and all sorts of things. And we did that for partners. And it, it was a lot like, I describe it as like when you first get into like making apps or technology, you always have a friend who's like, oh, I got an idea. Like, I've got an idea. Wouldn't it be cool? Like, you should make my app. And Axiom Zen, the founders, Rohan and Sam, who are brothers, had that experience, but their friends were like generally billionaires. And so when they were like, I have an idea, then they'd be like, and I have the money to make it. <laughs> yeah. And then we would do that and we would, you know, make really, really, really great apps and charge people for it. And part of the privilege of that entire experience would that we would have profit. And with that profit, we would say, oh, now we think we can shape the world. Like, it's interesting to learn from our partners. And we had the privilege of being very selective about who we worked with. And that was very nice. But then the byproduct of all of that was a small pile of opportunity that we had in front of us. And so I essentially led the consumer foundry there. And that was the like, if we don't have a partner, but we're going to build something, what are we going to build? And then that was kind of like, well, let's get Mac to come up with something. And not that we got to do what I wanted, but at least like I would try and convince people what we should try or they'd try and convince me. And I played a pivotal role in that consumer foundry, self-directed part of the business. Um, and so that was a lot of ephemeral messaging apps. And that was a lot of mobile games. That was a lot of like, oh, we're going to build the next Snapchat and we're going to we're going to build the next like Flappy Bird or th this kind of thing. Like, how do we hit those kinds of massive trends and waves? And and we realized the luck and the discipline and the commonalities and the discrepancies between those two examples I just gave and blah, blah, blah. OK, so Ram said to me, you know, we're doing all these consumer experiences and we're building all these things. And Ram says to me, he says, how do you feel about the blockchain? And I said, I'm pretty sure that's like a fancy word for Bitcoin that libertarian assholes use for why they want to take down their governments. And he was like, well, no, but uh, maybe. And he's like, how do you feel about making the blockchain fun? And I was like, well, that's a fucking dumb idea. Like, who, who, would, who would want to do that for any reason? And he was like, well, if you want to keep your job, you do. <laughs> <laughs> he hates it when I tell the story that way because he didn't actually say that. We were good friends and he never threatened my job. But he was like, no, dude, like, this is a massive opportunity. And as a business, we want to look at this. And like, that means you need to look at this. And I said, okay. So I went into the woods and I came back three days later and I came back with three truths. And the one truth was that I'd always wanted to build a gardening game. Something where you put a seed in the ground and you do not know what color or what shape the flower that blossoms will be. That kind of discovery seems really fun to me. Like literally for over a decade, I've been trying to put together a gardening game where you listen to the birds that come and the songs the birds make is different depending on what gardens are in your garden. Mm. That sounds fun and beautiful. So that was one truth, like this gardening game thing. And the second truth was that the only thing I'd ever seen on the blockchain, any blockchain that I gave even the remotest of fucks about was a CryptoPunk. So, and this part I used to not tell people because I found it kind of embarrassing, but in 2017, I didn't tell anybody and I spent $35 buying a CryptoPunk. <laughs> do you still have it? I do. Oh, man. I bought it because it looks like Wonder Woman and I love Wonder Woman. And it was the first time. That's badass. We can do a whole thing about the like avatarization and the PFPs and I haven't tried to buy things that look like themselves. I can tell you about the sexist, racist people buying CryptoPunks and the price of rarity of black female traits mm. versus others in CryptoPunks. I'm the only person I know who, given choice to buy any CryptoPunk on Earth virtually, like this was four years ago, and the only one I bought looked like Wonder Woman. I don't know if you can see me right now. I don't look like Wonder Woman. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> well, you're, you're, you're being absorbed by an Oni Ronin's head right now. You look like you're about to be eaten. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are not on on uh, YouTube, I'm sorry you can't see the look right now, but it's, it's a look. There's it's a whole look. thing going on. It's a look. Uh, uh, so so that was two truths: gardening game, crypto punks is the first thing that matters, and the third was that cats are opt out. You do not explain why you're using cats if you're building consumer applications. You explain why you are not using cats if you're building consumer applications. So the gasoline is the internet. 
People love them. They have been viral since before, literally since before the word viral existed, cats have gone viral. Like it's just, if you're trying to build things for muggles, if you're trying to build things for normal people who do not give a fuck about how the magic works, you just want them to care, then you put a cat on that motherfucker. And that is my cat thing. Now, the other side of that is I didn't come up with stoner cats. But I did hear about stoner cats, and I was like, cats, and my fucking Spider-Man radar did his thing, and I was like, that's probably a pretty good idea. <laughs> long answer, that's the cat thing. Um, that's amazing, and and we will get into stoner cats later. Uh, so you started to tell your story, obviously. I, I gave you a, a hard lead in, I know. But so your background, you're working at this agency, you're boss essentially comes to you and is like, yo, we're doing blockchain stuff. You're like, ew, weird libertarians in their basement. You don't know anything about NFTs. So, right? Like you don't know that term. You're coming at this being like, okay, I just need to make this weird technology thing fun and cats are what consumers want. <laughs> and so I don't think people really realize like you, you conceptualized and came up with CryptoKitties yep. and CryptoKitties brought us the ERC 721 standard, which is what all NFTs essentially are today. That's correct, correct? Every NFT that you care about is a 721 standard NFT, except for functionally two. All of the top shots, because they're on flow, but they're all built based on the lessons of 721, because it's the same architect behind both. It is Dieter. Yeah. Flow is Dapper Labs, which did crypto kit you did crypto kitties with. And so Yes. Dapper Labs was a, a byproduct of CryptoKitties success. After CryptoKitties right. blew up, we created Dapper Labs to manage the success. And so actually, actually, there are three NFTs that matter in this earth that are not 721s. One is Top Shot. Two is CryptoPunks, because they predated us, remember? Mm -hmm. I saw those before like, cool. we made CryptoKitties. And then the weird thing, which I'd actually forgotten until I was talking to somebody two weeks ago, is that uh, CryptoKitties are not pure 721s. The standard wasn't finalized. There's one call, there's one like method call on 721 standard that does not exist inside CryptoKitties. So they're like 98% oh, wow. 721. It's a weird little, for, for the historical nerds of this technology who either exist or who will come along, that is like a cute little fact. Uh, but yes, the 721 standard that literally every NFT that most people who listen to this will ever care about are truly and honestly a byproduct of us trying to figure out how to make cats fuck. Because <laughs> if you have a Bitcoin and I have a Bitcoin and we trade Bitcoins, you nor I care. Start with a Bitcoin, end with a Bitcoin, we're good. But if you have a pink cat and I have a blue cat and we trade, I care a lot because I don't like pink cats. I like blue cats. And so I have a text message to one of the most famous NFT collectors of all time named Richard. And Richard is the guy who just said who no. Just, he just said no to nine and a half million dollars, right? <laughs> so Richard is my oldest friend who's into blockchain. Like, Richard and me are supposed to go hitchhiking to ghost towns together and shit. We have like a weird thing. We've built apps about weighing elephants and all sorts of shit from the old days, long before any of this. And when I first came up with these crypto kitties things, I messaged Richard and I because he's my he was my Bitcoin guy. And I was like, hey man, I think they're gonna make my Bitcoin cat idea. And he said, What Bitcoin cat idea? And I said, Where are the Bitcoin cats? Fuck to mine Bitcoin. <laughs> That is how I first described. And like, honestly, a month ago, Richard sent that to me as a signal message and was like, this, this is an NFT. Oh, you need to post that somewhere. Send it to me. I'll post it. I know you're off social. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. And so, and so. Make that an NFT. Post it. Make it an NFT. It'll sell a million dollars. I got one about Top Shot too that I don't show people very often. But I got one about Top Shot. People are like, oh, like the OG days of Top Shot, the OG days of Crypto Kitties. I got screenshots, you know? Yeah, you uh, got the receipts. Yes, I have the receipts. You got receipts, baby. <laughs> did you know right away that CryptoKitties, or or how long into the process did you realize, like, hey, this is going to be a thing? Um, we got excited early on, but it wasn't obvious. I don't think most people ever know that what they're working on is obviously going to work out, or, or at least that takes a type of arrogance that I don't have. I have other flavors of arrogance, but not that flavor. <laughs> uh, so there was a couple, there was a couple sort of like... Um, inflection points or moments of note. First of all, one month before we went live, we uh, went to ETH Waterloo. So that was an Ethereum conference in Waterloo, a little town in Canada, and Vitalik was going to be there and everybody was going to be there. Like it was the one place where you could get all of the ETH people in a room at once. And we sent four people, Fabiano, 
Benny, Jordan, and Arthur. And they didn't even have tickets to get in. They just went there. There's pictures now of them, like, finishing the code for the Alpha, trying to get in. And they spent three hours on the Friday night begging people for tickets to get into that conference. And they somehow worked their way in. They're, like, scalping tickets to ETH Waterloo. literally to ETH Waterloo. (laughs) And Benny is a fucking maniac in the best sense of the word. Uh, And Benny got them all put on tie-dye shirts. And brought like helium balloon shaped like cat emojis. Oh and brought fucking sparkles and stickers. We didn't have a brand. Shit, I was wearing it. We didn't have a brand at this point. So we took a picture of a cat and put it on a space background and wrote Crypto Kitties. And that was our brand. for The, the, the whole thing was bonkers. We had no idea what we were fucking doing. We went to ETH Waterloo. They ran their alpha. The UX on the website was functionally non-existent. Like it was really and truly borked. But there was one little booth at East Waterloo where you could go there and the weird cat guys were doing the cats. And you could go there and like press the button on the Rinkby network three times and roll the dice and see what cat you got out the other side. And from there, motherboard, the vice thing, the mm-hmm. like vice mm-hmm. news, the whatever. vice tech. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. They wrote a thing about us. And that was like, huh, that's. Like, it was weird that they were there in the first place, but it's even weirder that they wrote a little thing about us. And so that was the first inflection point for me. Then we had a Telegram group, because this was four years ago. Discord wasn't quite what it is now. Like, for this community, Telegram was everything. It was always Telegram. And uh, we built this little Telegram group of sort of alpha users. And that grew to, like, a 1,000 people in the month leading up to the launch. And that was, like, a... Huh. There's a signal. Yeah, there, there's yeah, like a thousand exactly. people in ETH period at that time. Not uh, obviously, actually, but. <laughs> uh, and then the night before launch, I remember one guy writing. I, I got three more moments for you. They're all quick. But the night before launch, one guy in the Telegram group said, this is better than any Christmas. I cannot wait for tomorrow. <gasps> and when I read that, I was like, oh, really? Like, <laughs> I'm also excited, but that's that's You're like, you realize I just said I wanted to cat cats to fuck on the blockchain. Like <laughs> we spent a week, I swear to God, we spent a week at Axiom Zen going to meetings about at what point do you hand the sperm to the other cat? Oh like my the God. smart contract <laughs> transactions. There was like baggy sperm meetings that were legit scheduled and was very professional. Is that what the business. calendar event said? It was like yeah, discuss cat sperm. sperm. <laughs> it was it was a whole thing. Uh, about three days after we launched no 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 no. it was before we launched so we had a private beta we let a couple people like start it was was the real cats but it was like a little private space and a guy who worked at axiom zen but not on the project at all like very not related to what we were doing came up to me and said thanks for the trip to vietnam and i was like what do you fucking mean and he said well i just sold two thousand dollars with crypto kitties and i'm going to vietnam and that's because you and they're like people who were using crypto kitties at that time were like, you know, 10 people in the office and 50 people not in the office. And again, I was like, huh. And then the last one, I, I'm, you're calling me right now in my parents' house. I now live here, built a nice little house. Me and my family, we all live here. Very cute. But at the time, I did not live here. And at the time, I was staying in the basement. And it was three days after we launched. And I walked upstairs and two things happened at once. One, somebody sent me a message that was like, you just sold a cat for $30,000, which I now, I know now, like in our, in our multi-million dollar, blah, 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 like. Right. That seems like whatever. nothing, but at the time. At the time, nothing like this had ever happened. I promise you. And, and, and we're like, oh fuck. And we melted Ethereum. Like our website was broken. <laughs> the network was down. Everything was broken. I'm not smart enough to know what any of that means. Just that like my phone is exploding. Yeah, you just knew there were people you worked with who were very freaked out. <laughs> we fucked up everything and we sold a thirty thousand dollar cat. And it was at that point literally that we're all just like And that was day of it. launch? The, when was the thirty thousand dollar cat? Three days three, I think it was three days uh, I think it was three days later. I'm pretty sure, like at least the way I've now encoded the story in my head. I know where I was. I can see the stairwell over there. And I think it was three days after launch. Uh and yeah, then it was just like okay, this this is fundamentally different. Like, we don't know what we're getting into. And do you think, were people at the time really into it because they were actually like, oh, this is, this is a fun game. Like, I want to play this. Or, or was it like the novelty of it and the people who were already blockchain enthusiasts was like, oh, amazing, a new use case for this technology I love? Um, Most people who were very blockchain native hated CryptoKitties. 
most people who were very blockchain native were legit. Like the ICOs were everywhere. We talked about it right before we turned on the thing. I wrote a blog post when we launched called Fuck Your ICO. Because the thing to do in blockchain at the time was to write a white paper. And you would write a white paper and you would say, if you give me wild, wild amounts of money, here's the thing that I'm going to claim to do in the future. And this was a business model that worked. A bunch of, well, I don't know. Kind of sounds like roadmaps, (laughs) but like wanting more money? (laughs) Is that? Yeah, no. Make the distinction. They're $25 million roadmap. It was was a crazy time. And and we went out and said, we're going to do something different. And this was fundamentally different. We said, we're going to build a product and we're going to ship a product. And then you can pay us for it if you want. That doesn't sound revolutionary. That's called business for the last like X thousands of years in human history. But at, at that moment in blockchain, that was very strange and very different and was very good. Uh, but a lot of people in blockchain didn't like us, be, in Ethereum didn't like us because of our success. Like truly and honestly, we crippled the network. We brought it to its knees. Many people messaged me saying, fuck you, take your caps mm. off this network. We're trying to do important work and you are fucking it all up. And for like six hours, I was, I felt terrible. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, what have we done? And like, sorry, we were just trying to play around and like, oh no, we heard Ethereum. And after six hours, I started laughing and I like kind of haven't stopped laughing since. <laughs> it's just, yeah. the, the Batman who laughs over here, like it, it's just too much that you can't handle my cats. Like that was, that was an <laughs> you, you can't handle my cats. Couldn't handle it. All these dudes who thought that they were going to take down the government because they had like great libertarian values and great ideas on how technology could destroy the middleman and they couldn't handle my pink fucking cats. And that was a moment where I was like, oh, I'm the bad guy. I'm the villain. And I think that the villain with the pink cats is my new hero. (laughs) So you were bringing new people into into the space. And just so I'm clear on this, because I was not, I was like vaguely aware of ETH back in 2017, but I was not following the ICOs. I told you this before we joined. I like saw I had a, a colleague I worked with who was like showing me crypto kitties. And I was like, the fuck is this? Like, this <laughs> yeah. is so weird. And like pieced out from it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so at the time, all these ICOs were basically the difference between a, an NFT thing today is they were trying to raise like twenty five million dollars or, or these these massive sums of money, and it wasn't even a piece of art. Like there was no clear utility tied to it. Correctly, it was basically just like Bitcoin did it really well, so come give us your money because we're a, a variation on Bitcoin. Is that is that a fair way to characterize what all these ICOs were? Uh, no. Yeah. No. 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 That's, that's <laughs> like reasonably accurate. Um, in every case, it was like we are going to release a coin soon, mm-hmm. and that coin is going to be valuable because more people after you are going to want that. Coin. Want to buy it. So it's it feels a little MLME, which I sometimes accuse. Them very, space very, <laughs> very MLM. Okay. Multi level marketing scheme, multi level marketing for those who don't who don't know MLMs. Okay, and so you come along, and it, it strikes me that you're sort of a character that was not, as you said, not natively interested in being in the blockchain. I was the kitty, but, but Peter was the crypto. I was the kitty. You were crypto the kitty kitties, crypto two sides, and I was all the kitty, not the crypto. And you had this crypto friend, and and was and he was like, all right, you have to come do this. And so you, being more of a consumer oriented, I know people kind of a person were just the the perspective that at that point the community was sort of missing in the people who were building on it. That's what it sort of feels like to me. Does that that that's sort of I know you're you're gonna be humble about it, but that's sort of fair. You were like, all right, I get consumers, so I'm gonna do this thing that's gonna make all the purists really mad, but it's actually gonna get consumers into this space. I didn't realize we would make purists mad when we started. Uh, I just thought that we could make something that people wanted and understood and that was different and new and to be clear we did a bunch of so i have a like sort of hypothesis or a strategy or something about launching these things that is significant and it involves being true to the purists until you hit the tipping point so mm-hmm. the way crypto kitties like spiraled out of control in the best way possible spiraled up into the stratosphere was that we made a bunch of decisions like the price of crypto kitties was listed in ethereum that didn't make sense to almost anybody at the time why would you list in ethereum it's not in us dollars everybody here is thinking us dollars and we're like oh well we're making this for people who have ethereum and use ethereum we don't talk about this a lot but the goal of crypto kitties was to be infamous we didn't 
plan on making millions and millions and millions of dollars. We left the door open so that we could. That was Roham's genius. Me and Dita were going to do a certain thing. And Roham was like, guys, like, make sure that they can give us lots of money if they want to. Thank God he did. That was very, like, Roham's very smart what, guy. What were, so, you, what were you going to do? Ah, honestly, I was thinking about this the other day. I was trying to remember. There was, right near the end, there was a key decision that Roham came in on. And it was like, it wasn't like at a zero, but when we remake the Waltz, Wolf of Wall Street movie later about this and somebody yeah. just plays Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio and shit, he basically was like, just at a zero. Like, yeah. why, why did you, why, like, why did you? like charge more or it was just like yes, charge, yes, charge more, more. Yeah, charge more and charge an order of magnitude more let mm. them pay an order of magnitude more mm. uh and we should talk about the crypto kitties pricing algorithm that is one of the fucking smartest things i've ever seen in my life that was all Dieter. that was not me by any means but uh we did a bunch of stuff that was really honestly true and native to the ethereum ecosystem including having rock solid smart contracts like mm. to be clear that 721 standard with these cute little cats and this pink website everybody else was doing matrix bullshit it was like a green writing vertical and like black background and this is ethereum this is blockchain that's the future it's crazy <laughs> that's what everybody's doing and we're like we're gonna do cat puns our community is a super fun place to hang out like but that mattered a pink website with cat yeah. puns well-designed play, I won't even go so far as to call it a well-designed game, but well-designed play and then rock solid technology underneath it all. A bunch of those things appealed to the Ethereum people. If we had made trash, then the people who came in and were like, oh yeah, I have $30,000 in internet money to spend on this would not have. Mm. Once the people came and spent $30,000 and then another day later or something, you know what? 30,000 might have been day one and three days it was the $100,000 because there was also a $100,000 cat moment where we're just like, okay, like fucking the wheels have come off. This is this. Yeah. Is <laughs> uh, what have we done? <laughs> they're, they're, I, I don't want to speak for them. I had a woo, what have we done moment. And, but at that point, the New York Times comes along. When you sell a picture of a fucking cartoon cat for $100,000 on the internet, then you hit a tipping point and the mass comes. So when we're building these things, like, yes, I was always thinking about the consumer and that's just how I can't help not think that way. That's sort of how I'm wired. But being authentic to the community that was in place where we showed up, these people who had values and like we did not appeal to the libertarian fundamental nature, but not everybody who loves Ethereum. I make fun of them. Not everybody who loves Ethereum is a neck beard with a fucking libertarian bent. Oh, I'm the first person, this is true. I'm the first person ever to use the word neck beard in the New York Times. There's a, <laughs> there's a Twitter robot that will scour the New York Times and find first time uses of words. And after I did one of my New York Times interviews about this, and I was used to use this line with libertarians, the neckbeards, that's just like a sound bite I got. I got a tweet that was like, congratulations, you're the first person to ever say neckbeards in the New York Times. So I was like, okay, cool. Wow, that's, a, that's, that's something that goes in the, the Twitter bio or the resume or the LinkedIn you no longer have. That's- a, or, the, or the tombstone. Or the, to or the tombstone. Um, oh, I actually do want to talk about this pricing structure if you're serious about wanting to talk about it and why it was yeah, surprising. Yeah, it's dead simple, but it's beautiful. So Crypto Kitties, I mean, we did a bunch of shit so well and a bunch of shit really stupid. And uh, one of the things that Dieter put together was this pricing mechanism. So at the time on the blockchain, nobody could figure out English auctions, these standard auctions that we're now used to where like you have 24 hours and the price is going up and da da da. So we had to use Dutch auctions and Dutch auctions are where you have a starting price and you have an end price that is lower than the starting price. And during a set period of time, the price goes from the starting price to the end price. And the reason that's interesting is because anybody can buy it whenever they want. And obviously you should wait longer because the price is going down. But if you wait too long, somebody else will snap it. So it's a very interesting use of auctions for price discovery, which is the unsolvable problem in launching new products. How much should I charge for this? And so CryptoKitties was interesting. Every 15 minutes for one year, we released a new cat. That is how we made money. That was the main way that we made money. And there were some other little things that we did, but this was the vast majority of the income. And it was a significant amount of income. Every 15 minutes, the clock cat got released. That's what we call them, clock cats. And they would come out every 15 minutes for one year. It was 96 a day. And so 365,000 functionally over the course of the year. A little bit less than that. And the pricing was beautiful. The pricing was 
the average price of the last five plus 50%. And so the price would go up and it would go up and up and up and it would get astronomically high and people would finally be like, fuck that. I'm not paying that much for a clock cat. And then the price would come down because it was a Dutch auction. And when it got to whatever was deemed reasonable at the time, then it would get bought and that got included in the next batch. And so you had this constantly fluctuating, floating price, floating, that's my new word. Uh, and it was an incredibly dynamic way to understand what people were willing to pay. And then uh, because most people weren't around for CryptoKitties, the thing that made CryptoKitties so interesting was that you might get a new gene inside those cats. We had this big gene puzzle and the only way to get new genes, which was like the low number exclusive shit. If you're a collector, you understand this, but the only way to get that hot new shit that you couldn't get anywhere else was by buying our clock cats and then unboxing it basically and seeing like, oh, does it have one of the special stuff? And sometimes you could see it when you physically looked at it and you'd be like, oh, that one looks cool. But sometimes there'd be a real secret locked deep inside the genes. Mm. We built this weird ass gene structure around that game. And so that clock cat, I don't see, I've never seen that repeated and I'm not totally clear on why because I've also never seen a better way to kind of price something. Again, where people want to give you a lot of fucking money, this is a method by which they can. But if people decide that uh, what you're selling isn't worth that, they can discover a price that they feel is rational and it kind of like serves everybody really well. That's, yeah, that's so interesting. And, uh, you know, I've seen Dutch auctions done plenty of times since then, but never quite in the way you're describing there. Um, was this being done on like a bespoke website? Like OpenSea was around, but obviously very new. This is like you had your obviously OpenSea bespoke was site. not and around. OpenSea wasn't, it was started around that time though. Maybe it wasn't like. As was far like as I know, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, OpenSea was born to make CryptoKitties usable. Like. Oh, wow. It was, Crypto, there were other NFTs. The moment you spawned, we launched, you spawned it all. You spawned literally all of it. <laughs> we created a large series of problems, and many people have come along to solve many of those problems. You should hear Dan at OpenSea talk about the OpenSea mafia. You know, he'd be like with the PayPal mafia. Uh -huh. So there is a Kitty Hats mafia. The one of the first things that ever existed on top of Crypto Kitties was Kitty Hats, Hats on Cats. And a small team of people came together in our Discord, became friends, and built Cats on Hats. One of them is employee number one at OpenSea now. One of them is employee number one at Axie Infinity. One of them is uh, the lead designer at Dapper. And two others played significant roles in consumer evolution. And this was kitty hats. This was hats on cats. It's like, you know. This is what's so beautiful about this space. And, and because there is the like underdogs versus the institutions element, obviously to crypto and like, you know, like Wall Street bets bringing down Melvin Capital and like all these people <laughs> with a huge position on on uh, on GameStop, like putting a limit at like 42069. Like and these people are bringing down like massive institutional hedge funds. And it's like the people who are bringing down the future of banks all met because they were like, put cats on hats. Like, yeah. It's it's like I got fucking hate always coming back to this, but Dixon wasn't wrong. The next big thing looks like a toy. Mm -hmm. My my latest hypothesis is that what he was wrong is too strong of word. What he was he was too narrow. I don't think the next big thing starts as a toy is limited to technology. I think the next big thing starts as a toy is culture. Period. Pink haired rappers. All my shitty 40-year-old friends fucking hate SoundCloud rap. They hate that emo, mumbly, pink-haired shit. And they sound like their parents talking about rap. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, they're not even rapping. Like, the, the, oh, God, I fucking hate the auto-tune. Those guys, those guys, like, can they even freestyle? It's like, shut up, old man. What the <laughs> fuck do you care? This is These kids are making art. And and art, like, La Salon des Fous, the Impressionist art movement that became such a big deal in Paris. Uh, rock and roll as we know it, like, so many massive trends in art and culture started out looking like a toy. People being like, you have That's so many serious. people who 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 have thought that DeFi was how crypto was going to go mainstream, and it's now so clear, and it, I guess should have been clear from the beginning that it was going to be NFTs and art and music and weird cat games and like everything we know about the internet has been leading us to this point. Uh, but it, it's it's just so eminent now because um, it's all identity. People don't buy content. People honestly don't spend that much time thinking about investing. Like normal people don't. DeFi is really great for everybody who's smart enough to figure it out. 
Nobody who's a fucking normal human being understands what the fuck DeFi is going on about. But identity, people care deeply about. And NFTs are really just a placeholder for identity. The heart of that. Here's a very weird specific question. Hmm. Were there royalties baked in to CryptoKitty sales? Like, are you still getting some of that sweet, sweet CryptoKitty money? Uh, let me think about what we did. What we said was that, so Dieter, again, whose name has come up, very smart guy, the CTO, the architect, the engineer, the guy behind the 721 standard. And, and a lot of my ideas about crypto are um, a byproduct of basically studying his school. I think of it like Kung Fu shit. Like I got mm. Dieter style, you know? And uh, in Dieter style, if you own an NFT, then you should truly own it. Mm. You don't have to pay us royalties. You don't have to do a goddamn thing because you own that motherfucker. On the other hand, if you want to use our website, to perform a transaction, we will charge you a fee. And so that's what we did with Crypto Kitties. If you were going to breed them or if you were going to buy, I honestly forget if we took, I don't think we took a cut if you were just selling them. We said like, that's not our business. You own it. So you should be able to sell it. There's no royalties. It's not ours. Uh, but on the breeding of the cats, which was the main mechanic, we always said, you can go do that on your own. Build your own marketplace if you want. Mm -hmm. Build your own website. Call the smart contract directly. But if you go to CryptoKitties.com and use our UI to do this, yes, we take a small fee for that. Got it. Um, so you've kind of made reference to this in this conversation, and I've heard you talk about it in other conversations where after CryptoKitties or at a certain point in that phase, all this major IP started coming to you, and yeah. including and the NBA, which I think leads us to NBA Top Shot. That nice. actually surprises me. So. A, like, really? Like, did you have all these companies and brands were coming to you saying, hey, we want a piece of this? And then B, how many of them really got it? And how many of them were just, like, chasing a trend that they saw temporarily? Uh, um, yes, they all truly just came knocked on our doors. It was every major brand. It was every VC. It was every IP owner. I mean, not every. Every is an exaggeration. But, like, in droves, they arose, uh, They came to our door. Where this was that after the New York Times? Like they like read it in the New York Times. And were like, no, oh, the okay. New York Times wasn't even that. New. We just were making like like millions and millions of dollars selling cartoon yeah. pictures of cats. And whether you were Jurassic Park or the NBA or Doctor Zeus or anybody, it was like, what? Mm. Why? Why are people paying so much money for your pictures of my cats? They're just making memes out of our shit. We got our shit on Giphy and somebody gave you millions of dollars for your shit. How about you give us one of those? This was like a, a this was a thing that everybody was feeling uh, because, yeah. And, and to be clear, because of the ICO, I'm like right now, you know, um, crazy summer of or spring and summer of, of, of uh, NFTs. And we're on Saturday Night Live. And like we've all just lived through this insanity that is this recent spin of NFTs. The last time shit was this crazy was 2017. One of the things that we got right with CryptoKitties was just the timing. And a line that I used to use a lot, but it's true, is that like if a knitting magazine could find a way to write a print article about blockchain in November of 2017, they would have. Everybody wanted to have some way to write Bitcoin in their link bait shit. Or it wasn't blockchain, it was like Bitcoin block saying that. So in that time, when everybody needed to have an angle, anybody whose job involved technology at their work needed to have some kind of informed opinion on the blockchain. That's when we showed up and we were like, yeah, you sell cat fucking for a lot of money. Like, what? So yeah, everybody came and then, oh yeah, no, most of them didn't really get it. Not at all. Most of, most, no, most of them were like, well, and there's an interesting question as to what they got. Like I've just told you about kitty cats, kitty hats. Kitty Hats was hats on cats, and it was amazing. And it has led to hundreds of millions of dollars of business value being created by the people who organize themselves in our Discord to come up with that shit. Uh, and the fundamental concept of Kitty Hats is one of the biggest ideas in blockchain to us at the time, which was extensibility. Somebody else built Kitty Races. It was a fucking dumbass car racing game, but you put your cat in a car and you race it. And the thing about Kitty Hats that I loved, I was telling the story the other day, and Dan says I'm lying when I tell it, but I'm telling it anyways. First time I seen Kitty Hats, my reaction was, fuck you. 
you didn't ask us for permission. Why the fuck are you putting hats on my cats? Those are my cats. And then <laughs> you or somebody was like, dude, like this is the blockchain. You're you know, missing that- the point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you remember the conversation we had about extensibility and about how really cool this is. And then me having this moment of like, oh, that is cool. Like, as long as I'm not being Disney about this, like, as long as I'm not being so fucking precious about my little Mickey Mouse here, this is really, really neat. People are coming along and building value into this product, into this IP, into this network and ecosystem that we're trying to build. And these people came and built value for our consumers, which builds value for us. This is fucking incredible, actually. That decentralization and extensibility is a beautiful piece of blockchain. And you'll notice that NBA is not doing that. So when a lot of these brands come, this goes back to your question of who actually got it. Very few got it. NBA are very interesting, and I salute them for being the pioneers that they are. They have made a fuck ton of money for being pioneers, to be clear. Like, Top Shot has been very good to NBA. But that wasn't obvious. They took a risk building that. And even then, my point is, they've leaned into parts of blockchain that work well for them, which is true ownership of these moments and the economics around it and some of the sort of blockchain primitives that build up this ecosystem for sure. But there's other huge ideas that they definitely don't want anything to do with, which is like, oh yeah, we're going to remix the NBA brand because this is extensibility. (laughs) No, you're not. You're really not. Everyone is talking about the metaverse these days and we're all still trying to figure out what it actually is because everyone is looking for how to get exposure to it. That is why a metaverse index fund is so important because in such a young market, an index can give you broad exposure to all the various players who are building out all these digital worlds that will ultimately become the metaverse. And that's why you should check out the metaverse index from the index co-op. The metaverse index gives you simple, easy, and safe one-click exposure to the emerging open metaverse trend. The MVI index contains some of the biggest metaverse projects out there, including Axie Infinity, Decentraland, Alluvium, and more. So join thousands of holders who have already trusted nearly $50 million to the MVI index. And if you buy $500 of MVI on the Dharma app, you can receive $50 worth of ETH on the Polygon network. There's a link in the show notes for you to click so you can get started on your journey into the metaverse. Onjuno is your new crypto-enabled financial services company. Onjuno lets you get your direct deposit paycheck paid to you in crypto. Set up your direct deposit with Onjuno and receive part of your paycheck in your preferred crypto asset, reducing the time that you're holding on to your inflating dollars. The best thing is Onjuno sends your crypto directly to your own wallet, whether it's your ledger, your MetaMask, or however you hold your crypto. Onjuno can also be a checking account for your crypto where you manage both your cash and your crypto from one simple account. It's free and opening up an account with Onjuno comes with a metal debit card that gives you 5% cash back at select businesses, including Uber, Starbucks, Walmart, Target, and other Web2 companies. Use code Bankless when you create your Onjuno account and our friends at Juno will airdrop you $50 in ETH when you set up your first crypto paycheck. Sign up at onjuno.com slash crypto to get started. That's O-N-J-U-N-O.com slash crypto. I want to get into Big Head Club and and maybe one way to to do this, and I'm putting you on the spot here, but it, it feels like what you did in the CryptoKitties era was identify these ways to be really innovative in the space. And, and the big piece I think you brought to that was just understanding consumer behavior and saying, hey, nobody's tapping into consumer behavior in the blockchain right now. The industry has obviously gotten more sophisticated since Mm -hmm. those days, but do you feel like there are gaps right now or or real areas for innovation that you see or you're excited about? Again, I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 so NFTs are interesting. If you give people what they want, then you will be stuck in the present or the past. And Mm -hmm. so like, Sometimes I get mad when people are like, oh, I'll tell you about Oni Ronan. People are like, why are you like spending thousands of dollars trying to teach us about history? We just want pixelated animal pictures. That's like what we're here for. We want to flip our pixelated animal picture in the next 72 hours to make a lot of money. That's why we love NFTs. I'm and you're like, like cool, okay. don't buy my project. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Like, please don't. And I don't want your angry DMs. There are others who will get it. <laughs> oh, if it was DMs, I wouldn't even mind. It's the fact that they're like rage tweeting in public. I'm like, motherfucker. Oh, uh, in 2017, the way to make money in blockchain was to do an ICO. 
And we told everybody to go fuck themselves and we made NFTs. We absolutely understood where the ball was, where the ball was going. And we said, neither of those is right. Actually, we're fucking walking due west from here. And a lot of other people thought they knew that and they tried to walk west and we don't hear their stories, right? You never hear the stories of all the microwaves that didn't make it. At some point, somebody invented a microwave and we're like, oh, that was kind of obvious. But there's a thousand inventions like a microwave that didn't fucking make it. Point is that we had to have vision around the 720 standard and around playfulness and around true ownership and non fungibility underlying all of that. So now, Oni Ronin is a new project from Big Head Club. Big Head Club makes strange and marvelous NFTs that stand the test of time. I say that all the time. That is our motto. It's on our website. I find strange those... and marvelous NFTs that stand the test of time. That's it. That's awesome. that's the magic. And if we can deliver that, then we'll be doing this for a very fucking long time, which it seems like it's probably going to work out. But one of the things that we did is if you're watching on the video, only running behind me, uh, we went and took, okay, so I have a book, actually, you probably see it right here. Oh, okay. It's hard with the, I'm I'm going to Japanese. I'm getting word at a time. Japanese death poems. Yeah. Japanese death poems. (laughs) So I started learning about Japanese death poems and a samurai would attempt to write a haiku as close as possible to his or her last breath. The last moment that you were alive, you try and write your death poem. And the like, the most hipster samurai points you can get is if you get it like you, 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 you finish, the pen drops, and you die. If you could do that all in one smooth motion, you're the best fucking samurai death <laughs> ever. To live well oh is to die. Oh my gosh. In that, that world. Morbid. I do. I go on Twitter and just read that death poem book to people in Twitter spaces sometimes for fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so those, those haiku are amazing. Some of them were written decades before people died. Like not everybody succeeded mm. at nailing it, but you're trying to write it right again. Okay. So I love that story. Um, I was talking to a Japanese friend of mine who gave me the nickname Dekate, Detake, because it means big hands, because she used to hang out with me at Dapper when we were making all this stuff, we'd go get drunk at the bar. He's this old Japanese guy that I met. And we'd go get drunk at the bar and then we'd go back to the office and we'd do Hogwarts Lego. Because at, at Axiom Zen, Dapper, they always had Lego for me because I like Lego a lot. And so Sam, one of the co-founders, he liked Lego too. He would buy fancy Lego and we'd sit around and do Lego. And me and Take, would, me and my guy, his name I don't use for certain reasons, we got into it, arguing, getting along, having so much fun building Lego. He gave me my Japanese nickname. And then I was talking to him about these death poems and samurai history. And the NFT thing became inevitable that we needed to make uh, NFTs that celebrate the haiku of the samurai death poem form. And that's where Ronin came about. So... In all of that, we ended up creating these crazy things. I called my old neighbor. I was like, man, you want to make demon samurai art? And he was like, okay, side note, that guy was my neighbor for 15 years. I lived in a one-bedroom apartment with my wife and two kids for fucking 12 years. I didn't have kids for the whole 12 years. But for 12 years, I lived in a one-bedroom apartment. This guy was my neighbor. Right now, he's buying an island. Nope. He's buying a house. He's buying a house on an island off the coast of Canada. Because all the money I gave him for these fucking Ronin that he made for us. Like, we change artists' lives with this shit. So I went to him, and I was like, we need samurai. And me and my Japanese friend did all the design on this. We did all of the research to find these haiku. And so in the background of that guy behind me, you can see a real haiku written in smoke. That is a real haiku that a man or woman, samurai class, wrote in the last 800 years. And when you take your Oni Ronin, which I think has the best art in NFTs this year, outside of maybe Galaxy Eggs, because I really like the Galaxy Eggs as well, uh, in that world, you can commit your Ronin to the Trial of Ascension, and then you can listen to the haiku for the first time. We actually, uh, we got like this incredible narrator to narrate each of the 20 possible haiku that you can get. It's one of the rare characteristics, like everything else about the NFT. And then, and then we deliver amazing art. We deliver like historical context, interesting audio. The technology is rock solid. We did this entire interesting like reserve phase to stop gas wars on the launch of the whole thing. And now I'm getting to the point of this. We reached out to a guy who teaches at Concordia, a big university in America. He teaches about samurai history. He also teaches the Big Head Club about samurai history. The only way to get a class from that guy 
with small intimate group is to own one of these Ronin NFT. He got a hold of me. His name is Dr. Bender. And he said, you know, you could literally put together the best curriculum on samurai history in the English language if you hired five of my friends. And I was like, okay, done. Like, of course, that's fucking amazing. We have haiku lessons. We have calligraphy lessons. We have flower arranging lessons. And the only way to get access to any of this is to own an Oni Roman. The idea that we can redefine education and community, Dr. Bender messaged me after our first class. We did our first class this week and I was so fucking worried about how it'd go, but my team is amazing. I had nothing to do with it. They just made it happen and I showed up and honestly, me and my wife sat there and had this fucking incredible hour of history lessons with wow. Japanese surgery. So cool. And he messaged me and he was like, it's so nice to teach a group of people who want to be there and listen and learn. And they're not doing this for credits. They're doing this because they're like, oh, wow, in the middle of a Wednesday, yes, I want to learn from this. This is an incredibly interesting idea around what NFTs can be. We have ridiculous fantasy. Like some of these fucking things have got like hardcore death metal hands sticking out of their heads. This is just weird ass art. It's also historically accurate, interesting context. It's also incredible community. We're doing fucking Zen meditation three times a week as a community if you want to join. We unlock all that shit with these on your own. And, and the idea that you can have community powered education mm. is really, really interesting. And I don't see anybody else talking about that in NFTs. And a bunch of the people that I've talked to are like, I don't want that. I want a companion drop that I can flip in three days. Yeah. I'm like, cool. Do you? Do you still think about the floor price? Or are you like, yeah. Anybody I'm building an education don't, program. program. No, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> You don't get to build an education program if you don't think about the floor price. If nobody's going to come to your fucking education program, then it doesn't matter. Yes, I think about the floor price. Uh, I do not, nor will I ever use the word investment to describe what we do. Two reasons. One, the SEC is real. I'm in Canada. I still don't <laughs> want to go to your American jail. This is not an investment. This is not financial advice. This is not an investment. Do not buy a big headlamp token as an investment. Uh, the other reason is because I really like... Mm, if you are buying this because you want to have the CryptoPunk experience that I had, this is not for you. I do believe that many of our NFTs will, in the future, be able to be sold for lots of money. I think if that's why you're here, you're here for the wrong reasons, and you are not bringing real value to my community. My community started up a do it's been a long six months. It's been a long six months. And we now have what is consistently one of the nicest, kindest, most thoughtful, gentle communities in the world. Our Discord is fucking amazing. Our mods are amazing. And people are warm and gentle. And it's a little chaotic at best because there's 25,000 fucking people in there. And so sometimes it's a little mad. But it is a beautiful, amazing place where we are now treating each other respectfully. We're learning about history. We are shaping the future of art. And if that sounds like a fucking good idea, then you should come get yourself a big head club token. If you're like, man, I need 10x returns, where's my yield? And I need this on a timeline measured in hours and or days. Meh, there's lots of cool projects for you. Like you should go do that. You probably shouldn't go do that over here. Let's talk about some of the other big head club projects. We've talked about Oni Ronin, which is the latest drop. Very cool. Stoner Cats was the first drop, which yep. made a bunch of noise. <laughs> uh, how I, how did you get involved in Stoner Cats? You know, how did you yeah. end up on Zoom calls with Mila and Ashton and the the crew? Uh, the true answer to that story is, and we don't talk about the fact that we've raised a bunch of money, but we raised a bunch of money for Big Head Club. Uh, not a bunch of money, especially not in fucking 2021 NFT space. We raised a little bit of money. Let me put it that <laughs> but We raised we were... a few crypto punks and... Uh... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We, we, yeah, there's a lot. Money is cheap right now. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Uh, we raised a little bit of money and I got to this moment where like literally in three days of sort of calling a couple of friends, it was like, oh, okay, we've raised as much money as we want to. Like it was soft committed, but it was very easy. I mean, I'm the crypto kitty fucking top shot dapper guy in the middle of an NFT renaissance. Obviously yeah. it was reasonably easy. Yeah, it's, it's who do you want money from, not who. Will yeah. And that's an incredible privilege. I would not, don't let me betray like how lucky I feel about that. And almost actually to your point, I, I got sort of closed the rounds, air quotes, in three days, looked around and was like, wow, every single person at this table has a dick. Like every mm -hmm. one of you has a penis. And that's a problem because mm -hmm. I am a 40 year old straight white man 
with more privilege than most people could ever even fucking conceive of. And I think it is in exactly this moment that I'm supposed to share that privilege. This is exactly where I'm supposed to be like, oh, hold on. Like, Maybe there's another this is the way side of me that bought a Wonder Woman crypto punk. Yeah. Steps up. <laughs> so and, something's got to give. Yeah, something's got to give. And so I called all of my investors and I was like, hey, um, I would like to meet some of your friends. I would like to meet some amazing investors who are women. I would like to bring some other perspectives to this table. Do you know anybody great that I should talk to? And through that process, I met a woman named Maria. And Maria works at Sound Ventures. And so I was talking to Maria a bunch, and she's become a very good friend of mine. I, I hold Maria in very high regard. But during all of that, um, Maria, Maria works with Ashton. And so Maria is part of what we call 3050 gang, who are behind Stoner Cats. And as her and I were talking about NFTs, and she's she's a full DJ, and she fucking loves these NFTs. Mm. She like can't not buy the shit and sell the shit. And she's like, so deep in the life it's amazing and so while we were we called each other regularly sent each other funny gifts and talked about nfts and all this stuff and she was like hey my friend mila is like working on this project and they've got this amazing content and we're trying to figure out how nfts can work to like make this work and we just talked about a bunch of different ideas and i kept being like that's a bad idea that's stupid that's why did you idea. think it was stupid they just had some optimistic and totally unrealistic ideas about what NFTs could be or should be. And to be honest, I have forgotten what a lot of them were, but it was weeks of me talking to Maria regularly being like, no, that, that's dumb. Like you're smart, but that's dumb. And then eventually she was like, fuck you, come talk to Mila. And I was like, ooh, look at her. Like, <laughs> talk to Mila Kunis, oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then we did, and we, yeah, that, that's how I ended up calling Mila and Ashton for the first time, and then that just became a regular thing, and they sort of became friends, and and uh, and eventually we came up with Stunner Cats as, as we defined it, and that worked pretty goddamn well, to be honest. Has there been anything that has surprised you about that project, or uh, that you've learned that was oh, substantially I, I, different from Dapper? The, that that is a nine hour list, and so we won't go mm. into all of it. <laughs> um, what have I learned? I learned the cartoons are slower to make than you think. I've certainly mm. learned that. I don't make cartoons, but I partner with people that do, and I've learned a lot about that process. Well, I've learned a lot about the time of that process. Uh, I've learned a lot about DAOs. I didn't learn anything about DAOs while at. Uh, you and I have have had a couple conversations about DAOs. Yeah, the trials have, um, and tribulation of the DAO life. So much to learn. Um, and to be honest, like, you know, not being around the bush, we learned about celebrity. We we were excited about that project because we were bringing people, and I honestly fought with them, fought is a strong word. I discussed loudly with them for weeks about what NFTs mean and the value of NFTs and all sorts of things. And we were super stoked to do that project. And then a bunch of these shit lords who think of themselves as the kings of NFTs were like, Oh, you brought cash grabbing celebrities to our ecosystem. Fuck you. First of all, it's not your ecosystem. Second of all, I spend more time in Discord talking to my community, helping them build out the DAO, helping them figure out what's next, trying to do cool stuff for that community than probably any project on earth. I realize that's bold. Gary spends a lot of fucking time in his Discord. Let's give him that. Uh, (laughs) Well, I'm in Gary's Discord. Give <laughs> <You're laughs> for that, yeah. <laughs> right? uh, that guy's very good at what he does. Very smart guy. Uh, so, yeah, we learned a lot about community building and... What's and, one... And I know I, I don't want to keep you for too long, but what's what's your one big takeaway around community building that you Never stop. from Stoner Cats? Never stop. Never stop. Never, like, like, remember that everybody could be having a bad day. Remember that everybody... Uh, who's here cares for a reason. You know, I've had people, even in CryptoKitties, on CryptoKitties, the price would go down on CryptoKitties sometimes. And I had people message me and be like, I spent my rent money on CryptoKitties and the price is going down. You're a fucking asshole. And on the one hand, I would be like, wow, no, actually, you're the asshole. (laughs) I'm just some dude on the internet trying to make things that are fun. But on the other hand, and like, you're dumb as shit, clearly. But... You're dumb as shit and your rent is on the line. Yeah. That sucks. Like that's a terrible place to be in. And so community building, like if you're serious about it, you're you're there for people in their bad days. We have people who like 
snap in our Discord. And then I go DM them. I'm like, hey, for months, you've been really cool. Like, really fucking cool. And you were just really mean to a bunch of people that you know and like. Why would you do that? Oh, well, my husband just walked out on me. Mm. 48 hours ago. I'm I'm reeling from that. <laughs> no shit. Yeah, that really sucks. Now, nobody saw that. People just saw you being shitty on Discord again. Or for the first time. And if you're really serious about building community, like all these anonymous fucking animal profile communities that can up and disappear in the middle of the night, they don't have to really worry about community. Mm. My name is on the shit. We're going to be doing this for years and years and years. I was going to ask this. Do you think it's important that senior people on a project be the ones also in a Discord versus just having, call it a team of mods who are maybe intermediaries? I don't think it has to be the senior people. I think it has to be people who are empowered to serve that community. And so if, like, I, I'm very much a senior person. I'm the CEO of the company. Uh, I'm in Discord because right now that's the right place for me to do that community. It's so valuable to us to create value for my companies, to create value for that community. Those two things cannot be pulled apart. There is a world in the future where I don't actually spend all that much time in Discord. Um, there's a lot of other things I could be doing. Do I hear a uh, wisp t- wisp in your voice? <laughs> it's my there's favorite a time my in the favorite. future when I see the sunshine and I go outside and I feel the wind on my face. There is nothing like the random DMs from strangers in Discord that are like, "I love what you're building here. Please never stop." We get mm-hmm. we get like heartwarming, tear to your eye type moments in Discord in public, in private, all the time, and it's fucking beautiful. And then other times, there's people just, when next episode? When floor moves? <laughs> over and over and over. You're like, dude, I'm even fucking up, man. We're working on it. Like, really? 16 hours a day. We're in here bleeding for you fucking people. We're working on it, my friend. So, yes, occasionally I wishfully, wishfully, wishfully try and get out of Discord. Occasionally, all I want to do is pop into Discord. Our Discord is such a nice place these days. It's incredible. It's so, like, like I, Discord used to be taxing. And Discord is now, honestly, where I go for a bump. It's like, if I need to feel good, I should just go say something funny in Discord and people are like, Mac, we love you. I'm like, yeah, thank you. (laughs) I'm going to go to my next meeting now. Uh, But but no, you don't need senior people in the Discord. You need people who are empowered to serve the community in the Discord. I want to get close to wrapping up. I have so many more questions I could ask. The first thing I want to shout out, Ghostbusters. So that's your next launch is Big Head Club. You have like the the rights to the Ghostbuster IP to make it an NFT. Is that what's going on? We do. We have so this is an incredible project because Sony is fully on board with this. I talk to Sony uh, twice a week, every week. Sony is super oh excited about this. That's so but exciting. Sony is not leading this project. Jason Reitman and Gil Keenan are leading this project, and they are the director and the writer, director slash writer and writer of this movie. So the guy who directed the first two Ghostbuster movies is named Ivan Reitman. Uh, Mm -hmm. He's a legend in the filmmaking world. His son is named Jason. His son made Juno. He made Thank You for Not Smoking, or Thank You for Smoking. Mm -hmm. And now he's doing the new Ghostbuster movie. So Jason and Gil fell in love with NFTs. Jason and Gil got a hold of me and were like, hey, we have this really cool concept for NFTs. Can we do this? And I was like, yeah, so long as it's not four striped Adidas shit. Like, I can't go make off-brand Ghostbuster fucking NFTs. Mm. And they're like, no, no, dude, like, fuck you. We are the director of the movie. Like, my dad directed the original movie. This is a family legacy for us. But this is not Sony's project. This is our project with Sony's blessing. And and so then we're like, oh, well, fuck. Like, this is really cool. And so, yes, Ghostbuster NFTs, Ghostbuster Afterlife, the movie's dropping on November 19th. We have a campaign called 12 Days of Afterlife. I will let people decipher when that starts. And we have some fucking amazing NFTs and a really neat sort of community experience built out around that coming soon. Any hints you can give on that? Uh, I would tell you that I would tell you that at one point, Baby Yoda took over the internet as the most interesting thing on the internet and that you should consider what creatures and characters might exist in the Ghostbuster movie that people are calling the next baby Yoda. Okay. That gives me a lot to think about. <laughs> I will contemplate that one. Final two questions. Yeah. First one. Do you think NFTs are mainstream right now? Uh, yes. 
I don't, I, I don't, uh, let, let's, let's think of it. Um, I don't think most people on earth have ever bought Supreme brand clothing. I don't think that my mother knows what Supreme is. I do think that Supreme is mainstream. I think of NFTs the same way. Like, is it Walmart? No. But do most, if you throw a rock and hit somebody, they probably have an opinion on an NFT. They probably don't own one, but they probably have an opinion on it. It's How probably, recently do you think that happened? Uh, last six months. That sk- it could have just been me, but that skit on Saturday Night Live at the beginning of the summer really mm-hmm. felt like like a sort of a crescendo. Uh, crescendo is the wrong word because we're not on the way down. Like you know, I I really do think they're. I don't. I, I guess it depends what you mean by mainstream. I like that thing I just said that everybody has an opinion. Very few people own them, right? Like. Coinbase is coming. Twitter is coming. Facebook just changed the name to Meta. Real mainstream is still coming. This is not Walmart. But you're not an interesting, obscure person because you have a fucking opinion on NFTs anymore. Okay. In 2018, Mm -hmm. you were asked in an interview Mm -hmm. uh, what you think, like make a prediction for the crypto art NFT world in five years. This is what you said. (laughs) Where is it? Uh... I think crypto collectibles are going to be a meaningful part of people's identities in five years. Not one, but in five years, you will be able to point to your crypto collectible profile online and say, these I own and they matter to me and you can understand me by understanding my crypto collectibles. That struck me because it has been so on point. We are already there within a certain part of the population. Yeah. I think over the next three years, you still have three years left for this prediction to come true. You'll increasingly see that be true. Exactly. Like you kind of nailed it in a big way. So of course, my final question to you is, what is your prediction for the next five years of NFTs, crypto collectibles? Um, in the early days of Facebook, the like most interesting feature on Facebook was the poke. And it literally, do you remember the poke? Yeah, yeah. You and you have poke streaks. Profile? It was like, how many days have we been poking each other back and forth? Oh my God, like he must like me. He poked me, you know, 30 days in a row. My favorite question was, would you poke your boss on Facebook? And most people would be like, no. And it's like, well, why not? Like, what is the, what is the poke? And, and so for anybody who wasn't paying attention at the time, the poke was a feature. You could, you could poke somebody. But <laughs> what that meant was never stated. There was no yeah. consequence for that. There was no output it was just this arbitrarily odd digital behavior that that was odd and still somehow acts as a kernel for the entire social experience this many years later it, it, it's not hard to see how the facebook poke seed became our notification centric hyperware plugged in connected reality so one one thing that I either heard or said or somebody told me, I don't know. Across the time, an idea came up that what Facebook did was make something that was uh, until then organic, which is relationships and friendships. It made them digital and it made them explicit. You had to outright say, I send a friend request. We have a transaction that indicates we've crossed some threshold. Like before, we just used to get a ride home in the same person's car from a party three times. And by the time I was done, we're like, hey, you're my like car seat buddy and we're friends. I'm like, that's cool. Now, now, now we're sending friend requests and it became explicit and digital. And I essentially feel like we are at that point with NFTs. I feel like things are like, yes, you can go look at your constellation and say, value me because you are looking the world I described and where we're going to get with these Twitter profiles and all these things and this like showtime and the, the sense that you should go to a specific place and in this digital and explicit way, you should see me trying to peacock myself and represent myself with these entities. And I think where we're getting to is just like where Facebook is far more nuanced, not just Facebook, but the social experience is not an explicit poke. The social experience is, I mean, there are, uh, multitudes of interactions that we can have that add context and are subtle and are more than that and less than that and they all feel very natural at this point. That's where we're going with these NFTs. We'll get to a point where I will look at your Instagram profile or your TikTok not profile but just like your picture and your profile and there will be three 
NFTs in your TikTok profile and nobody's going to be like, oh, yeah, look at my NFTs. You just be like, oh, that's cool. They got the thing from Ghostbusters. Yeah. And we, we know that you paid for it because, of course, you did because it's 2026 and people pay for digital things that matter to them because their identity matters to them. And we will simply have um, dissolved away all of the explicitness and all of mm-hmm. the, all of the like, I have to poke you. I have for you to look at my NFTs. No, it's just our identity. It's just who we are. That's what I think. Love it. I, 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 adding on to that, I think you're going to end up in a place where like you're on dating apps and instead of it, like you going to, you're like more interested or maybe not more interested, but you're equally interested in checking their PO apps and NFTs and, you know, all of that Maybe. stuff. And it's more informative to you than their Instagram or TikTok profile. So uh, four or it's years all integrated ago, into one. Four years ago, I called the head of product at Tinder, who was a friend, and I said, you should allow us to use NFTs as a way of representing yourself. And it'd be super fun to put an experiment in Tinder where like, yeah, you spent money on this NFT. That means you care about it. That means it's a good representation of self. Fuck the song I listened to on Spotify most this week. Like that's just whatever ear were my head. What matters to me is uh, these NFTs that I bought. Can, like let's, let's do a test. Let's do that Tinder. And the guy, I think Jim Morris, JMJ, he's the angel guy on Twitter. Uh, he said, for me to run an experiment, I have to believe it can make me $100 million. That is the scale of Tinder. And so <laughs> what you're talking about makes a lot of sense. He legit got NFTs. He's like, you're Tinder. selling cats fucking. I'm selling human beings fucking. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The scale is different. <laughs> the scale is so insanely different. And, and, but now we're at that point. Now Twitter is doing those things. So yes, you are right. That is the world that is coming deeply and strongly. And truly, I concur. I am excited and afraid. But <laughs> <laughs> on we go. Thank you so much, Mac. I really, really appreciate you hanging out with me Friday night, recording this. Can't wait for Ghostbusters. Any final words? Be nice to each other. Love it. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.